This video is part of Project Imperial China, a multi-channel collaboration. Stay tuned till the end of the video to learn more. Beijing, Spring 1605. A bureaucrat from the provinces races towards the capital. His main goal is to take the Jinxi exam, the highest level qualification in the civil service. But since setting out from his home, news has reached him of a strange foreigner from the West who professes to believe in one God, but is not a Muslim. The foreigner's name is Matteo Ricci, and he is a Jesuit missionary from Italy. But the bureaucrat, Ai Tien, has never heard of Christianity. And if Ricci is not a Muslim, Ai believes, then he must be an emissary of Ai's own people. He must be a fellow Jew. There are many legends. Early modern revisions would later claim that Jews first came to the Middle Kingdom during the Han or even the Zhou dynasties, but these claims first appeared long after the fact. Like most places, we can't put an official date on when the first Jewish trader appeared on Chinese soil, but as is often the case, the answer seems to be during the Golden Age of the Tang Dynasty with the arrival of the Radhanim. Archaeological evidence in Gansu and Xinjiang provinces has revealed Hebrew prayers and Judeo-Persian documents dating back as far as 718. But, as ever, these were just visitors, not permanent residents. Although the collapse of the Tang brought the dominance of the Radhanim to an end, Jewish traders from Persia and Central Asia continued to travel to China, and by the early 12th century, a permanent community of some 2,500 Persian-speaking Jews had settled in Kaifeng capital of the ruling Song dynasty. The exact date and circumstances that led to this settlement are lost to history, but we can gain some valuable context from what happened afterward. In 1126, the Jurchens invaded from the north and established the Jin dynasty, but the Song continued to hold out in the south, and most Jews not only went with them, but were honored for their outstanding service in the Song army. In fact, for a long time, the new Song capital Hangzhou actually had a much larger Jewish population than Kaifeng. Their intense loyalty to the Song, as well as the fact that they had arrived in the country as whole families, suggest that these Jews were welcomed as refugees rather than an ordinary procession of merchants, though exactly what persecution they had fled is unknown. But ultimately, as the Jin-Song conflict turned into a permanent stalemate, most Jewish families returned to Kaifeng establishing China's first synagogue there in 1163 and serving other Jewish visitors as artisans and merchants. This is how, some 20 years later, China's Jews became early adopters of the teachings of Maimonides. Now, by this time, a much larger Muslim community, known as the Wei, had already existed in China for centuries, and Chinese authorities made little distinction between the two groups. Official documents referred to the Jews not as Jews, but as either blue-capped Muslims or the group that removes the sinew, due to the removal of the sciatic nerve from slaughtered animals as part of kosher ritual. Unfortunately, these ritual distinctions, as well as the fact that most Chinese Jews still spoke Persian as their first language, brought the stigma of being barbarians, a status which they had to fight against for centuries. But it was a fight they ultimately won. In 1420, a common Jewish soldier named An Shan exposed a plot by Governor Zhu Su to overthrow his uncle, the Yongle Emperor. As punishment for this plot, Zhu was ordered to finance the rebuilding of the Kaifeng Synagogue. An Shan, meanwhile, was honored by the emperor with the new name Zhao Zheng. Soon, all eight of the Jewish clans would receive proper Chinese surnames, signifying that they were no longer barbarians and opening the gates for centuries of distinguished and disproportionate service in China's military and its civil service. Ultimately, it was the civil service that would truly set Kaifeng Jews apart from their Persian-speaking brethren to the West. Within a couple generations, the teachings of Confucius, which had been the foundation of Chinese bureaucracy for nearly 2,000 years by that point, had so thoroughly permeated Jewish society that Confucian quotes could be found posted in the synagogue courtyards along stock Jewish prayers like the Shema. Keep in mind that Western scholars like the Jesuits had yet to categorize Confucianism as a religion, so this wasn't seen as a contradiction within the Jewish community. In fact, Confucianism and Chinese cultural traditions in general actually have a lot in common with Judaism. However, whereas Jews elsewhere had forsaken animal sacrifice since the destruction of the temple, 
The influence of Confucianism had restored the practice to the Kaifengim as a form of ancestor veneration, though not ancestor worship in the traditional Han sense, as they would be the first to tell you. It's at this point where we find a familiar story, in which the development of ocean-crossing ships severely undermined the importance of the Silk Road and the onset of the Little Ice Age all but killed it. Now, in my previous video on Jews in Central Asia, I mentioned that there is a persistent myth that the decline of the Silk Road caused Central Asian Jews to become totally isolated and begin to lose track of normative Jewish practice. In Central Asia, it was a myth. In China, it's exactly what happened. By the time Aitien first met with Matteo Ricci in 1605, the last contact between Kaifeng and Bukhara had only been a few decades earlier, which wasn't so bad. But just three years later, Chief Rabbi Li Wei Sha died, leaving the community without any members who had received a traditional rabbinic education. While his son Li Zhuo Wu was ordained as the new rabbi and tried his best, he was little more than an amateur, and so it would continue for the next couple centuries. Communication between the Kaifengim and the Jesuits would continue through the fall of the Ming Dynasty and the rise of the Qing. But from the Jesuits' writings on the community, we know that this was a period of continual decline. In 1642, the Great Synagogue was destroyed in a flood, and while most of the sacred texts were recovered and copied, the synagogue's edition of the Talmud was totally lost, and without the Silk Road, it couldn't be replaced. The synagogue was rebuilt for the last time after another flood in 1679, when the Jews were still being hailed by the Qing as exemplary citizens, wealthy, educated, and valorous. But that would soon come to an end. In 1724, the Yongzheng Emperor issued an edict banning most Westerners from China. Bereft of the Jesuits, the Jews lost even secondhand contact with their kinsmen, and their exploits became a mystery once again. In 1842, the conclusion of the First Opium War reopened China's interior, and immediately, Westerners began searching for this lost colony of Jews at Kaifeng. By the time the American missionary W.A.P. Martin had revisited the community in 1866, it was barely hanging on at just 300 members. The office of rabbi had been vacant since the 1810s. Hebrew and Persian literacy had been totally lost with some Kaifengim plying the once-treasured Torah scrolls in distant market towns in the vain hope of finding someone who could read them. Intermarriage had also become much more common, with Westerners remarking that the rediscovered Jews now bore a distinct mix of Han and Semitic features. In the 1850s, amid the increasingly turbulent environment of the later Qing, an officer from the Gao clan had sacked and torn down the synagogue. His synagogue and sold off its building materials to be reused in other places of worship in the city. Now totally bereft of their cultural center, and in many cases their homes, Jews disappeared entirely from the military and civil service, falling into severe poverty and becoming easy pawns of the city's criminal underground. Throughout the mid-19th century, Jewish scholars and philanthropists from India to the United States tried and failed to re-establish a rabbinate and yeshiva in Kaifeng. And for a long time, this was assumed to have been the point when Kaifeng Jewish culture died out. But it never did. The Jews of Kaifeng had never been compelled to abandon or conceal their Judaism. These people knew that they were Jewish, and so did their neighbors. They still didn't eat pork. They hadn't so much assimilated as secularized, albeit by necessity. And in the early 20th century, their numbers actually began to rebound. But by that time... Kaifeng represented only a small fraction of Chinese Jews. Back in the 16th century, Portuguese conversos had tried to revert to Judaism at the newly established colony of Macau. However, unlike in India, where Jewish communities already existed to welcome these refugees, these people had nowhere to escape to, and were quickly and conclusively hunted down by the Inquisition. Following the First Opium War, a handful of Jewish families from India, such as the Kaduri family, settled in the new British colony of Hong Kong, and they're still there. At one point, Hong Kong even had a Jewish governor. But the Jewish presence there remained quite small until the 1970s, and as far as I'm concerned, Hong Kong is not part of China. But starting in 1903, thousands more Jews began to move into Harbin, the newly built hub of the Chinese Eastern Railway. 
These arrivals mainly consisted of deserters from the Imperial Russian Army, at a time in which it was actively encouraged for ethnic Russian recruits to murder their Jewish comrades due to their supposed weakness. After the Russo-Japanese War, more Jewish deserters and their families found refuge in Harbin, and by the outbreak of the Chinese Revolution in 1911, Harbin had eclipsed Kaifeng as the largest Jewish community in East Asia, under the de facto leadership of Dr. Abraham Kaufmann. Kaufmann was not the only community leader in Harbin, but his importance to the Jews of China was unparalleled, and his role only grew as more Jewish refugees came to Harbin, fleeing the rise of Soviet Supreme Leader Yosef Stalin. But by this point, another city was starting to compete with Harbin as the center of Chinese Jewry. In the years immediately following World War I and the Russian Revolution, over two million Jews left Eastern Europe. Jews had been leaving the region in similar numbers for decades before the war. But with an increasingly isolationist United States ending its open-door immigration policy in 1921, these migrants now looked to other destinations, such as Palestine, Western Europe, Latin America, and Shanghai. In contrast to colonies like Hong Kong, Shanghai was legally part of China. But as most of the city was administered by Britain and the US as an international zone, it was largely insulated from the chaos of the warlord era. Unlike the European powers, Jewish refugees in China were treated with much greater sympathy by native Chinese leaders. In the Jews, Kuomintang leader Dr. Sun Yat-sen saw a fellow Asian people humiliated and dispossessed by Western imperialism, as well as a powerful ally in the global fight for national self-determination. Writing in praise of the Zionist movement, and hiring the Canadian Jewish adventurer Morris Two-Gun Cohen as his bodyguard. Although Sun died tragically of cancer in 1925, Cohen remained in service to the Kuomintang, eventually rising to the rank of Major General. And it's a good thing, because Jewish life in China was about to become much more complicated. In 1937, the Second Sino-Japanese War began ultimately becoming part of the Second World War three years later when Japan formalized its alliance with Nazi Germany. Now, the Japanese Empire committed horrific atrocities and enforced a brutal order of racist oppression wherever their armies took control that paralleled that of the Nazis. However, Japan's treatment of Jews was very different. Inasmuch as Japanese society had ever engaged with Jews or Judaism up to that point, it had been a largely benign and at times even positive experience. Harbin had been under Japanese occupation since 1931, as part of the puppet state of Manchukuo. And while Japan formally entered an alliance with Germany, Abraham Kaufmann successfully lobbied the local Japanese forces to ignore German requests to confine the city's Jews to a ghetto. Meanwhile, Japanese and Chinese diplomats both saved thousands of European Jews from the Holocaust by giving out visas during the pause on the Eastern Front between the fall of Poland and Operation Barbarossa. As the European and Asian theaters of the war became more intertwined, Germany put increasing pressure on Japanese forces to confine the Jews of Shanghai to a ghetto, which they finally acceded to in 1943. But without two millennia of politically and religiously ingrained anti-Semitism, Japanese authorities continued to puzzle over the obsessive hatred for Jews espoused by the Nazis. When German authorities in Shanghai demanded that the Jews be handed over for extermination, a vexed field marshal Shunroku Hata asked the Hasidic rabbi Shimon Sholem Kalish why the Nazis so hated the Jews. Kalish simply replied, in Yiddish, because we are short and dark-haired. The implication being, because we are Asian. By this response, Hatta was persuaded not to hand the Jews over. Though perhaps he should have considered the implications of that statement for everyone else under Japanese occupation. Meanwhile, an escaped Austrian Jewish doctor, Jakob Rosenfeld, volunteered his services behind Japanese lines as a general under Communist Party Chairman Mao Zedong. While on the nationalist side, General Cohen was captured at Hong Kong and returned to Canada as part of a prisoner exchange in 1943, but remained active in the Kuomintang as a diplomat and negotiator. This is how, when the Second World War came to an end and the Chinese Civil War resumed, there were Jewish generals on both sides. With the defeat of Japan in 1945 and a rapidly escalating struggle for Jewish independence in Palestine, most of China's Jewish population quickly departed the country. In Soviet-occupied Harbin, 
Abraham Kaufmann was arrested for Zionist activities and sent to a gulag. Kaufmann had left Russia long before the revolution and thus should not have been treated as a Soviet citizen. But such was the resurgence of Stalin's paranoia against the Jews that Kaufmann was to be made an example of. He was released in 1956 as part of de-Stalinization and finally escaped to Israel in 1961. Following the communist takeover of mainland China in 1949, most Jews who had previously chosen to remain in the country finally departed for Israel, including, oddly enough, the communist general Rosenfeld, who is credited to this day as the founder of the modern Chinese healthcare system. General Cohen, meanwhile, acted as an intermediary between the communists and nationalists, and was so respected for his close relationship to Sun Yat-sen that his funeral was attended by dignitaries on both sides. Today, the Chinese government celebrates the legacy of Harbin and Shanghai as safe havens for Jews during the tumultuous first half of the 20th century. The same cannot be said for China's oldest Jewish community at Kaifeng. Jews are not one of China's 55 officially recognized ethnic minorities, nor is Judaism one of the five officially recognized religions. When the community of Kaifeng petitioned Mao Zedong to receive such recognition in 1953, both he and future Supreme Leader Deng Xiaoping agreed that such political power could be co-opted by foreign powers to subvert their new regime. This despite the fact that the Jews of Kaifeng numbered fewer than a thousand at this point and had been living in China for over 800 years. So even as historic Jewish sites in Harbin and Shanghai undergo state-sponsored renovations, the Jews of Kaifeng live in state-mandated obscurity. There are no signs directing tourists to the site of the old synagogue, and government surveillance of this minority is only growing. Their fate is uncertain. This is part of Project Imperial China, a multi-channel collaboration. In the previous video, Hikma History talks about the Battle of Talis, where the Abbasid Caliphate met the Tang Dynasty. In the next video, Veritas et Caritas separates fact from fiction in the Opium Wars. And if you're new to my channel, I'm Sam Arano, and you can check out my other videos for more Jewish history.